everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Unisolve Question. And I have this brilliant, wonderful guest today. Her name is Jillian Natsu. Hello, Jillian. Hello. Thanks for having and, me. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to have you. We had a brief chat before starting this recording. And I was completely shocked by the way you pronounce your last name. You pronounce it Natsu. And for a second there, I uh, I changed my mind. I originally thought it was a Ukrainian last name. And I said, so it's not a Ukrainian last name. And then, and then you said, no, no, it is a Ukrainian last name. So uh, can you talk a little bit about your family history and uh, how your last name is now pronounced Natsu? So my family history is that my grandparents immigrated from the Ukraine in the 20s as children, um, separately, obviously. Um, my grandfather, my Didi, um, actually stayed behind in the Ukraine for about two years um, while his family immigrated with his younger siblings and then followed alone um, when he was 11. And as the current parent of an 11 year old, that really blows my mind. Um, he landed in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I've actually, um, when my parents and I were out there last year, we actually found the, the records of his arrival. And then again, with, we assume no English, um, managed to take a train to be reunited with his family in Montreal. And, um, he eventually moved to Dauphin, Manitoba, which is a popular place for Ukrainians. And uh, I guess he he met and married my Baba in Montreal. Then they relocated to Dauphin, Manitoba, where my father and his three brothers were born. Um, both my my so my Didi, my father's father, my grandfather, uh, died before I was born. Uh, he died when my dad was sixteen, so I never knew him. But I understood him to be a very um, future-facing man, as as my father is also a very future-facing man, and do not spend a lot. They're not very sentimental. They don't spend a lot of time dwelling in the past. So, while the roots of my last name are very much Ukrainian, uh, I was not raised in that culture, and so I. I uh, can't really claim it as my own, if I'm being honest. Uh, to my mm -hmm. knowledge, I don't have any family left in the country. And while I have this very unusual last name and, you know, I think a very direct link to the country, um, I consider myself Canadian at this point in time, for better or worse. So I guess that answers my next question. If uh, you don't speak Ukrainian, I assume. I don't. And sometimes I sometimes I wish I did that I had a more concrete link to this um, very uh, prominent aspect of my past. And there are branches of my family in the country that that do speak Ukrainian. Um, there's um, my Didi was also one of four children, and some of them remained in Montreal, and the children they raised there speak Ukrainian. So those are my third cousins at this point in time, who I still know, um, and they have a much more tangible link, but not me. Well, you have a relatively recent immigration history in your family, uh, yet your path is quite um, Canadian, or WASP even, if I can put it, put it this way. So you went to a private school yep. um, in uh, Oakville. Yep. And uh, you went to Queens. You got your undergrad from Queens in history. And then you went to UFT Law, uh, the cradle oh, of so many guests of the show who achieved great heights after. And uh, you went to UFT Law did you cross paths with Andrew Bernstein in your, uh, at UFT Law? Uh, it feels like 1999, 2002. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I think Andrew... There's so many cross paths. So many people went to law school with him that, you know, now I, I, I'm paranoid that everybody went to law school with him at UFT Law. I did not go to law school with Andrew Bernstein, though I now consider him uh, both a colleague and a friend and a, a, a quasi mentor sometimes. But I think that he is um, 
uh, five-ish years ahead of me. So, oh, I, I see. Yeah. So I made not, him a compliment. We did not walk the halls together. Yeah. All right. I made him a compliment. He's uh, He was on the show, by the way. As quite a few of your uh, former colleagues. Uh, so uh, after UFT Law, you went to Learners and you stayed at Learners for a while. And uh, yeah, for how many? 15. Oh, 15, correct. So associate first and partner. 15 years, that's a long path. And I'm sure you uh, met Earl Cherniak during the, during that time, who was on the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure you uh, you met uh, Jasmine Akbarley, who is now Justice uh, Jasmine Akbarley, who also was on the show. And I'm sure you met and uh, worked with Cynthia Keel, who is also a former guest of the show. So for some reason that I don't understand, some firms just uh, gravitate towards me or I gravitate towards them. And uh, it turns out now that I researched your history that quite a few people from learners came to the show. So tell me a little bit about working with this legend, Earl Cherniak. Well, a common denominator for Jasmine, Cynthia, and I, Justice Eckrelli, Cynthia, and I, is that we were all juniors for Earl Cherniak, sort of one after the other. And yeah. he he is everything he's perceived to be. He's uh, brilliant, dogged, determined, generous, and was a real privilege to work with him as a junior lawyer. I actually had the office next to him in my first um, three-ish years, I would say, at the firm and had the privilege of being fourth chair on a couple of big files that he um, was first chair on. So the whole Hollinger debacle, um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to call it a debacle when we acted for Hollinger, but um, the sort of shifting parties, we were counsel to um, Conrad Black. I don't know if he's once and again, the Lord Black. Um, and um, there was a big case between Air Canada and WestJet uh, about corporate espionage called Spies in the Skies and um, you know, worked with him on that. Another fun fact is that uh, to my right was Earl Turniak on the corner and then to my left, maybe down one, was Bradley Miller, who's now Justice Bradley Miller of the Court of Appeal. And when I started articling at Learners in 2002, um, Justice Miller was also articling there. <laughs> he was um, transferring to Ontario from British Columbia. And at that period in time, you had to do sort of a truncated articling period. So he he was he had come to the firm to be an associate, um, but he first had to do this very short articling period. So I often tell people that we articled together. And a uh, true story that he will hate me sharing is that he's a real coffee, coffee aficionado. And somehow I conned him into making me very special coffee in his bodum sort of every morning that I articled and was then a young associate. And um, he's a hilarious, interesting person in his own right. And so sometimes I would get to have morning coffee with uh, Earl Cherniak and Bradley Miller. Is the uh, worst ways to start your career. Absolutely. You know, learners, lawyers are also known for doing a lot of trials. Is it true about you and uh, when about your tenure at learners? I definitely did a lot of trials in my early years. I, I did my very first trial with Peter Jervis in the federal court. Um, it started in my articling year and concluded during my first year as an associate. We actually um, brought a claim on behalf of a former cabinet minister named Sinclair Stevens, setting aside the report from a commission of inquiry, um, the, the Parker report. So that was a really interesting twist as well. I think sometimes when I tell people now that I spent my first five years in corporate commercial litigation, they that doesn't really add up for them. But I think that I was really lucky to get the chance to do some really interesting work with very talented litigators at a firm that was like 
young and small and dynamic. And so it was, it was turned out to be a great, a great place to sort of learn the tricks of the trade, so to speak. So explain then, how did you end up doing sexual assault, sexual harassment, sexual abuse, all, all these kinds of things? Not so you that, personally, I, but, you know. <laughs> um, that also traces back to learners. Um, there's a partner there named Elizabeth Grace, who is one of the true pioneers in the field of civil sexual assault in this country. And I was lucky to start working with her as an articling student as well. Um, she was actually one of the big reasons I uh, went to learners. I have a background in feminist issues writ large and was very interested in her practice. And so in addition to doing strange federal court trials and corporate espionage with Earl, et cetera, I always had a small part of my practice that was devoted to civil sexual assault with Elizabeth. So it's actually the one area of practice that has been constant and continual throughout my whole career. Fascinating. So. Well, it's interesting. You had a brief stint at Adair Goldblatt Bieber and uh, the middle name there, Goldblatt. So Goldblatt, Jay Goldblatt was a guest on the show, Jordan mm -hmm. Goldblatt. So now I found one more person from your past who was a guest on the show. So uh, I, yeah, it's it's also a bunch of cool uh, cool guys there at that firm. Uh, how did you land there? Did they uh, invite you? What happened? Yeah, I had reached a point at Learners where I felt like I had really hit maybe a wall and a ceiling. Uh, I was feeling very boxed in. The firm had grown significantly during my period of time there. Um, my closest colleagues and mentors had left. Um, Jasmine Acquarelli, who you mentioned earlier, is was and is continued to, continues to be one of the most significant mentors in my career. She'd gone to the bench and I had a vision for what my future practice could look like. And it was running up against the way in which that firm was structured. So I say that the organizing principle for my practice is, you know, sexual misconduct, sexual violence. Um, and that sometimes involves tort claims. It sometimes involves employment law. It sometimes involves public law, privacy, class actions. The law gives me actually quite uh, quite an eclectic toolbox in terms of how to seek remedies for my clients. And the way many firms, including learners, organize that toolbox meant that I was in six practice groups and it was becoming uh, just untenable for me in terms of um, building a practice within the firm. Like I, I was, it was a very fractured situation. Um, so for a lot of reasons, I also think that, that the culture of the churn, the, 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 the firm was changing. It was becoming sort of more defense focused. I was having issues with conflicts, um, that sort of nimbleness and, um, uh, eclecticness. Flexibility. Yeah, flexibility that I had loved so much in my early years was um, not not a thing I was experiencing anymore. So for a whole host of reasons, it was time for me to go. Uh, it was also very hard to go. I had been there for 15 years. I think anybody who's left the firm that where they were born and raised after sort of, you know, a decade or two knows that it's uh, it's a it's a challenging thing to do, both intellectually and emotionally. So I had talked, I'd, I'd had a number of offers or potential offers. And what I really wanted was a platform to build and to be at a firm that was going to be young, brave, nimble, courageous, and was going to let me be me, really. And I knew Jordan Goldblatt from a Corners and Quest that we had done together. Um, I was counsel to a Children's State Society, he was counsel to their union, and we had got along. And so it seemed like the right opportunity to jump at. And it was a good move in the long run. Um, 
I guess another one of my mentors or most important people in my career is a, a woman named Jane Southern, who was a uh, associate at learners and then a partner at learners and then moved into sort of career coaching and um, during the time where I knew I had to leave learners but was trying to figure out what I was going to do next she just kept telling me you just have to make a move and you have to get comfortable with the idea that it may not be your last move and that was terrifying to me and it was so hard to make that first move I was really fixated on you know, where I went was going to be where I stayed for an additional, an additional 15 years. Um, but it was funny because after about a year and a half, I realized that it definitely was not the right firm for me. Um, you said they were cool guys or something like that. I would emphasize yeah. the word guys and their values, their culture did not align with what I wanted uh, my firm and the culture of the firm I worked at to be. And so it was time to go, you know, and I, I say that without um, meaning to throw stones. They are doing something that, that they, the three of them agree on and that they want to be doing. And so kudos to them on their success, but it was not something I wanted to be part of any longer. And so I jumped. And I left because Jane Southern told me that basically this would happen. I would go somewhere and finally sort of cut the apron strings, be, be free of learners, and that I, you know, might make another move before I landed somewhere that made sense. And I guess you landed home because you landed at a place called Jillian Natu and Company Advocates. Yeah. That's your home. That's literally your home. That's your home base. I mean, to be clear, I'm in an office you. right now, but <laughs> yes, I, um, no, yeah. no, no, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, 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 I mean, home figuratively. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I finally, and it's all women. It's all women. I, it's I think that I women. finally, it's all women. And we'll talk about that. Um, I finally realized that nobody was going to, um, you know, like there was going to be the place that I had in mind didn't exist. And so I was going to have to build it is really what it came down to. Um, it is all women. I would like to say that my first associate was a man. Um, and so as much as I love the fact that it's all women, I think that it's integral sort of to the culture of the place. Um, it's not, it's almost more by default than design. So the last time, the only time we've posted a job ad, um, we had, I think, almost 80 applicants and one male. So mm -hmm. people are self-selecting. What am I to do? <laughs> yes, yes. It makes a lot of sense. Um, why do you think, uh, but explain, please, why do you think uh, the, uh, the area that you dedicate yourself to sexual harassment sexual assault um, sexual misconduct why do you think women gravitate towards that uh, field and i mean the obvious answer is that women are, are usually the victims right but is there any other reason for other than the obvious one i think the law is patriarchal and i think that women see the the alert and the challenge of not just representing individual clients, but also opportunities to sort of push the boundaries and the margins and the structures of the law. So I, I think that that's part of it. Um, you know, separate and apart from the substance of the law that the firm practices, I think there are a lot of women who will tell you that they're very attracted to the idea of uh, working with other women and the uh, opportunity to work with more senior women. I guess I have to concede that at 20 years, I'm sort of becoming more senior. Um, and so I, I think that that's part of it. I think a lot of women go to law school with um, aspirations to sort of use the law to um, push and change norms in society. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for that in the work that, that in the areas that I practice in. 
Um, in the 20 years that I've been doing this work, like since I articled for Elizabeth Grace, the changes in my area of law have been significant. Like it's been a really, really dynamic period, which makes it a really interesting and awarding, rewarding and fulfilling um, period to have practiced in it. Um, you know, it, there were uh, two or six year limitation periods when I started to do this work. So all a big chunk of our fight would be whether or not the, the plaintiff was out of time because it's often decades before victims of childhood sexual abuse come forward with their allegations. And then even when you manage to get over the limitation period through, you know, discoverability arguments, um, the damages awards were uh, like just insulting. Um, it, it's really, when you go back and you look at them now, it's just incredible that you would get like less than a hundred thousand dollars for, you know, having endured years of really awful traumatic sexual violence from a parent or a caregiver or a teacher or a religious leader. So not only is there the sort of physical harm and discomfort and the psychological harm and discomfort, but also that like uh, really intrinsic breach of trust. And you see the damage that that does to people over time. And I, the uh, legal system, the courts, the judge, the judiciary, I think, it took them a long time to recognize that. And I, I think that's direct, directly attributable to the fact that it was so predominantly male for so long. So, you know, pushing the needle on that has been a long-term project, but you can really look back and see in retrospect how much it's moved. You mentioned the patriarchy and um, I want to read from your post on LinkedIn when you um, shared the news of uh, your award, recent award, uh, being named as top 25 most influential lawyers. You wrote, when my kids tell me they want to grow up to be influencers, I'm not sure this is what they have in mind. Still, I'm delighted to be recognized by Canadian Lawyer Magazine for my work combating gender-based violence and dismantling patriarchy so you mentioned patriarchy earlier and you mentioned patriarchy in this post so before i ask you what patriarchy is and what what you i'm not gonna have to google a definition <laughs> <laughs> don't you have it written down somewhere you know for court submissions <laughs> um before i ask you about patriarchy i i, I wanna i wanna sort of approach it from a little bit of a different angle we have murder in this country right mm -hmm. and um, murder is an exception rather than the rule we have theft in this country theft is an exception rather than the rule i mean i lived in a country at a time where when theft was the rule Right? I, I witnessed the breakdown of the Soviet Union. I don't wish it upon anyone to live through times like that. I also know how quickly um, permanent structures can come down and disappear. Right, So um, assault, being punched in the face, is an exception in Canada. It wasn't an exception, by the way, when I was growing up, again, in a different society. It's definitely an exception in Canada. Um, it's not the rule. Um, my guess is well, motor vehicle accidents are an exception in Canada, right? Our roads are generally safe. If they were the rule, I mean, who would drive? Um, so my, 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 my point is, I guess, if these common... Well, murder is not common, but motor vehicle accidents are. If these common torts or or uh, wrongs are an exception, then surely uh, sexual assault, sexual abuse is is, a, is also an exception. It's probably a much bigger exception. When you say patriarchy, are you then talking about something just much more than just sexual abuse, sexual misconduct, sexual assault? Or is patriarchy... A, 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 an umbrella term uh, that um, signifies this whole uh, history, uh, the past, the, the present, the future, or something else? So 
I think the law and legal structures were built by men for men. So when I talk about patriarchy, it's the fact that the experience of women, you know, is not, it's not built in um, to our legal structures, uh, dating back, you know, into 14th century England and the common law. Um, so I think on a very high level, that's what I mean. When I um, sometimes do training or give lectures on um, sexual assault in Canada, um, I often go back to the pre-1982 criminal code where rape was an offense that could only be committed by a man against a woman. Uh, you had to, um, it, there, you had to prove penetration and you could not rape your wife. So uh, in addition to that, baked into the criminal code were two rules of evidence that were particular to the offense of rape. The first is that you had to report at the first opportunity uh, the doctrine of recent, it, it, there was a recency doctrine, but it was right in the code. And basically- Freshness, you, freshness, some, some yeah, sort of freshness I, argument. Um, it, there, there's an actual word for the do doctrine and I, I'm struggling. The do doctrine of recent complaint, I think is what it's called. Um, and you go back and you see in the case law that they're fighting that she went to the police the next day as opposed to that night. And that does that, um, because basically if you could demonstrate that the complainant who was almost always a woman, well, it had to be a woman because only women could be raped, um, you know, didn't report at the first available opportunity, then the court was directed to draw a strong, uh, inference against her credibility. Like it was right in the legislation. And in addition to that, you needed corroborative evidence. The word of a woman was deemed to be so inherently untrustworthy that this was the one particular offense where you needed you know, you needed corroborating evidence. So when concepts like that are baked into our legal structures, it takes a long, long time to unpick them. And it's interesting how I think we still see them show up. Example, if you look at what our courts today award for sexual assault and violence within the confines of a marriage and compare those awards for general damages to every other case, you know, that's not before the family courts and in the context of a divorce, um, it is shocking the difference. Like, it's just, it will, I, I, if I'd known that we were going to talk about this, I would have a slide for you. And I think that that really um, traces back to a time where you couldn't rape your wife, you know, like, and um, family violence was considered to be a private matter as between the parties. I mean, these are laws that were in existence in my lifetime. I was born in 1977. You can all figure out how old I was. So, I mean, when I, when I see those, you know, things, um, I, that is what I mean by patriarchy, you know, and my, to tell more family stories, my mother's mother, um, my mother was, was a child of divorce in the fifties and uh, lost custody of her, uh, of my mother and her sister, because in, while they were waiting for the divorce to process, she had another child out of wedlock. She'd repartnered and ended up having three more children. And because the divorce papers didn't get through in time for the birth of her third child, um, she lost custody. And, and there's just like endless examples like that. So when I talk about patriarchy, that's what I mean. I'm probably using the word patriarchy a little bit more right now just because of the Barbie movie. <laughs> And my kids are obsessed with it um and it's kind of a running joke uh in our household right now about when you you're talking about patriarchy are you, are you referring to horses um anybody who hasn't seen the barbie movie won't understand that but um so you know that that is that is what i think of and that is part of what is so um motivating about the work that we do I mean, another example I can give you is that Canada started to introduce uh, sort of privacy-related legislation in the early aughts. And so there was legislation that protected your, you know, your healthcare uh, records and, 
you know, other kinds of, of private records and, and all of this. And that's great. I, I certainly want my healthcare records protected, but it took until, you know, I think 2015 in some jurisdictions, well, 2015 until they made the crime of uh, non-consensual distribution of Im intimate images a crime. I mean, we're still trying to use a patchwork of sort of torts and statutes to uh, advance um, claims for the harms that that flow from that, because you know people aren't le far less concerned about um, the privacy interest I have in my body and my image and the way it can be commercialized and shared. I think I've been so, talking for ten minutes, right? So I'll stop. <laughs> no, no, but no, you should never stop. On my account, this is all about you. This is this is a really great answer. I've heard a lot of I heard a lot. Uh, of things that were fixed so you told me about the old criminal code you told me about the old um, divorce law you uh, you also told me about some things that haven't been fixed like for example general damages and you know general damages in general are so political uh, yep. they're extremely political they're they're based on their discretionary uh, in a sense they're based on the judge's of course, they're based on precedent, but they're basically based on judges' idea of of the value of the harm, right? Um, so you, you mentioned one thing uh, that hasn't been fixed, the general damages. You mentioned another point about the hodgepodge of laws um, uh, in, with respect to one of the areas that you were talking. What are the, in your opinion, what are the top three legislative priorities right now or legal priorities that things that have to be fixed in, in the area that you work in? The Human Rights Tribunal and the fact that it has exclusive jurisdiction over harassment and sexual harassment is a huge problem from my perspective. I mean, in part because it's been gutted in Ontario and is essentially non-functioning. But even when it is functioning, there are two further significant problems in my view. The first is that it has a very strict one-year limitation period. And the uh, the harms that are intrinsic to enduring long-term sexual harassment are very similar to the harms intrinsic to do enduring sexual um, assault and battery or long-term sexual abuse. There is all, often a lot of shame and self-blame. There are other potential mental health impacts. And, um, you know, a common theme I hear is that people just want to get away from the situation and put it behind them. And it's only after they've had an opportunity to sort of process and heal and rest and reflect on it that maybe they're ready to take action. But guess what? They're out of time. So that's a huge and easy to fix situation, I think. I actually think that it's um, a big um, gap in the law that you cannot uh, in a lot of situations, sue for sexual harassment. I think that it puts um, people who experience that in a situation of having to rely on, I mean, having to settle for human rights damages, which are also embarrassingly low, and, and don't compensate for all of the actual tangible harms and, you know, that can be experienced, including um, past and future loss of income, past and future therapy costs, and there's a lot of talk about things like non-disclosure agreements and, and other ways in which to combat sort of um, sexual misconduct in the workplace. I think that if employers had to start paying for the real actual impact of these wrongs, then you would see that sort of behavioral change that we talk about. Um, I think that the Human Rights Tribunal actually is is uh, sometimes works as a bit of an insurance policy. So that's that's a that's definitely a big one. Um, the Ontario Court of Appeal has said no uh, tort of harassment. That doesn't mean that the provincial government couldn't create one through statute. So that's one. Um, I think that the dismantling of the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board is a travesty. I don't understand it. It was funded through the victim's surcharge, and it was uh, the singular best tool available to victims of sexual violence in this province. You didn't get a lot of money, but you did have the opportunity to tell your story to a neutral third party and be believed in a way that is enormously cathartic and therapeutic to many people. 
and to recover some money, even if it was 10, 15, $20,000 um, that afforded you the ability to access therapy, to take some time off if you needed, to sort of get some stability uh, and, and, and take a breath in your life so that you weren't in a state of constant crisis. And so it would have been a rounding error in the provincial government. I have to think that the decision to dismantle that tribunal was more ideologically or uh, philosophically or politically motivated because I, I don't understand it. I think that it probably saved the province, its taxpayers, um, its social systems, a great deal of money in terms of what it has instead had to pay out to people through you know, healthcare costs and other forms of social programs. So that's two. Um, I think the privacy torts are a big mishmash and it would be great to, to get some clarity on how to best advance them. I mean, my, in my view, if something is an offense in the criminal code, then there has to be, it is a compensable wrong and there has to be a way of sort of threading the needle to get to that. And it's not that we haven't been able to do it. It's just that it's it's a bit of a mishmash and it really depends on which court hears uh, your case, um, who opposing counsel is, things like that. Um, I think there's some tinkering to be done with limitation periods on in some of the provinces where there are harms adjacent to just claims for sexual abuse and sexual assault. So that's a list off the top of my head. <laughs> if you told me you were going to ask that, I probably would have taken the whole hour, but there is it's a good list. Yeah. And I mean, I, that obviously focuses on the fact that I primarily do tort law on behalf of individuals. I think if you had a family law lawyer um, on this, there would be just um, a panoply of other suggestions, really. Um, as I'm sure you know, since you've obviously Googled me, I just finished a two and a half year stint as yes. commission counsel to the Mass Casualty Commission. And, and we looked at um, gender-based violence and sexualized violence and the links between that and gun violence quite extensively. So I don't want to preempt any of your questions, but yeah. Yes, I, I will ask you about that commission. I will ask you about how to become counsel to commission and how it's different from uh, other legal practice, other law practice. But before we get there, I want to uh, tie the loose end on torts. Yep. And uh, I want to talk about legal category creep. So let me explain what I have in mind. Um, you know, murder is pretty black and white. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't mean there could be no issues there that could be argued, whatever, but it's pretty straightforward. Rape was pretty bright line, right? Sexual assault is now more vague. And I believe there is a lot more case law in the years since sexual assault, uh, the sexual assault offense was created than ever existed for the offense of rape right because there are so many aspects of sexual assault mo the most important of which one of which is consent right so it's a little bit more ambiguous a little bit more on the spectrum if i can put it this way now uh and i'm talking about uh, category creep here right so and then and then we get to sexual harassment i think this is way more on the spectrum than sexual assault because different people understand sexual harassment differently now we have this case where um, someone who worked with robert de niro i'm sure you heard of it sued him because he asked her to scratch his back twice and then he gave her tasks that are stereotypically given to women um, and uh, he called her at all hours and he yelled at her so i wasn't sure if it was if sexual harassment was alleged there or some sexual misconduct was alleged there or if it was just constructive dismissal because she was stressed out but i'm sure one lawyer one day will argue that this was sexual harassment because he asked her to scratch his back twice i don't know what men feel when women scratch their backs i don't know i i don't usually get that treatment from anyone so but i'm sure somebody can argue that and then so can you talk about the, the category creep? Are we at risk of losing the sight of um, what's really uh, dangerous and, and creeping into areas that will generate surely a lot of legal work for a lot of lawyers, but 
will create a lot of anxiety and stress and conflict in society that will not really solve the core issues. What do you think about this? I disagree. Good. <laughs> I disagree with the concept of category creep. Um, I, I don't know about De Niro, so I, surprise, surprise, I don't know every celebrity that's been sued. Um, I think what you have characterized as category creep is what I am talking about in the law, not recognizing the harm that has been perpetrated on and injured by women for centuries. And I think you said, you don't know what it would be like to have somebody scratch your back. When's the last time a man, you know, uh, uninvited scratched the back of another man? I think it's a pretty unusual thing to do, which suggests to me that there's not a baseball. Out. Well, you know, and, and context is everything. I mean, when you say there's a lot more um, case law on sexual assault than there were uh, was on rape, that's probably true. But I think you're probably referring to the criminal uh, sphere where I don't work. And so in the civil sphere, um, the law recognizes the right of each of us to autonomy over our bodies. And I think that assault colloquially is thought of as somebody punching somebody else in the face, but it's actually, you know, somebody yeah, making physical contact in a harmful or offensive way with that, you know, that's it. That's, you don't have the consent doesn't come into it. If you prove that, um, if I prove that you came and uh, scratched my back and that, in all the context of it, the fact that you held power over me, were able to influence my career in a micro and macro way, all these other things, and that you came over and scratched my back for five minutes, then I mean, like that's that's the I'm potentially to some people offensive, right? It's certainly not respecting boundaries. I think we can agree with that. You know, how much money is it worth? I'm not sure. But a major difference between civil and criminal law is that consent doesn't come into it until it's raised as a defense. So it's not, um, it's what's called an intentional tort. And you prove it by, by proving that the contact took place. Um, there's no mens rea component. There's no intending to touch without consent. And that goes back to Supreme Court's decision in Scalera. So that's very clear. Like sometimes I, I get asked about how does reasonable belief and consent factor in? Like it doesn't. There's like you can raise consent in defense and either you had it or you didn't basically. So and, and it gets proved on a balance of probabilities. So all of this. I'm going to be controversial and say all around me scaremongering about creep and stuff like that. I mean, I think is the law just starting to appreciate the perspectives and ex, um, experiences of people who are not, I'm going to say, you know, white men um, at its most simplistic, who, and, and to be clear, because white men constructed the common law. So, you know, law, law is flexible for that reason. So um, I should probably say white straight cis men uh, constructed the common law. Um, and that and leads that me is... to my next question. Oh, good. <laughs> we're just we're just not avoiding any subject today. Yeah. Why 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 not? Right. So I mean, you are such a brilliant lawyer that is such an expert in this field, and you also have thought deeply about the political uh, um, foundation of these issues. You have thought deeply about the philosophical foundation of these issues. Who else am I going to talk to uh, about this? Oh, well, you know, you're the obvious. Selection. I'm not going to talk to judges about this. That's for sure. <laughs> there are or maybe I should. Questions. Maybe I should. <laughs> I mean, really, 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 what you need to do is bug a conference of uh, women. But anyway, um, I think I think what sets me apart from a lot of women on, in this area is that I do now work for myself. As you say, I am home, and so right. I have less constraints. Right. That's why I have my own practice. I don't answer to anyone, but the law, well, I, I answer to the system. We're all part of the system. Oh, sure. Uh, the rules of professional conduct exist for a reason. But anyway, so you were, I was, I asked you about the legal category creep. And then in your answer, you alluded to the victim category creep. Let mm -hmm. me explain what I mean. 
um, first you blamed only white men, and then you corrected yourself, and then you said, well, maybe not blamed, but you know that you. No, you no, said, no. I'm talking about the way the law was constructed. Right. And I don't. That shouldn't be a controversial statement because if you go it's, back and look at who could be a judge, you had to you had to be a landowner too. So a landowner, yeah. landowner. You had to be a first a peer of the realm and all that stuff. So. Like these are historical facts, as you say. I have a degree in history. Um, yeah. This is how the law was built for many centuries, and it's not the case anymore. But um, I, I think that's a historical fact. Controversy is our living. We live for controversy. Right. We resolve them. We start them. We conclude them. This is all we do, right? So this yeah, show yeah, is all about controversy. controversy. Sorry. And I'm going to get hate mail after this, Pulat, but that's okay. No, so. oh, well, maybe, maybe then uh, let's talk about the Mass Casualty Commission. Maybe that will be <laughs> a, uh, a a more, um, a less controversial subject. So uh, I know that you were counseled to uh, the Mass Casualty Commission, and we don't have to say what that commission was created for or why. What I'm interest, more interested about, uh, in is the mechanics of how you became counsel to the commission and how that's a form of law practice, how that form of law practice is different from mm -hmm. other forms of law practice. Yeah, it really is. So to answer your question of how I became counsel, um, the commission, for those who are not aware, was created in the wake of a uh, mass casualty event, two-day mass casualty event in that started in a small community called Poripik in Nova Scotia and um, spanned 13 hours and about 100 kilometers and resulted in the death of 23 people um, in April of 2020, so the early, very, very early days of COVID. And the federal and provincial governments um, created a um, commission, a public commission of inquiry to look into it. And when any commission of inquiry is created, um, the governments issue uh, orders in council. And that is where the commissioners, the, the orders in council, they create the commission and they appoint the commissioner or commissioners. In my case, there was three. And they give them instructions essentially as to what they are to look into and that is the beginning of the end of of what the government gets to say about it because it's an independent process so in the um uh orders and council for the mass casualty commission one of the things that they were directed to look into was the role of gender-based violence and so they were looking for a member of the senior council team to sort of take on that piece of the mandate um, they initially tried to find counsel in Nova Scotia, and because it is a much smaller bar, um, could not find somebody with the requisite experience and no conflicts, um, which prompted them uh, to reach out to me. And one of the three commissioners, uh, Dr. Kim Stanton, I knew um, through work we had both done for LEAF, for the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund. And so that is how uh, I ended up receiving an invitation, um, you know, and I will say that um, although I am, certainly have no roots in the Maritimes, my husband does, and uh, his father and siblings were born and raised in Sydney, Nova Scotia, and it turns out that one of my father's, sorry, one of my husband's uncles taught uh, Chief Justice Michael McDonald, eighth grade. So I also passed sort of the maritime litmus test. Um, and so that's how that came to be. Uh, I can't remember. Oh, you wanted to know how it's different practice. It's it's exceedingly yes. different practice. I mean, I think the other thing that, that may have put my name on the list to be commissioned counsel is that I had done two very long inquisitorial processes before that. Um, the first being the coroner's inquest into the death of Ashley Smith, and the second being the coroner's inquest into the death of Caitlin Sampson. And coroner's inquests, like inquiries, are inquisitorial as opposed to adversarial. Mm -hmm. And so they are dynamic, multi-party pro um, processes in which you're supposed to be working together to 
find facts, essentially, as opposed to arguing with each other about what the facts are. Um, and so that at it, its it, it, most sort of essential is the difference between commissions of inquiry and, and virtually any other form of um, adversarial process. Um, the, this is the first time I've acted as commission counsel, and it, it's a challenging role because you are um, I mean, neutral in the sense that um, you are not vested in any particular outcome or findings the way you are when you represent a party. Um, it's also an amazing role because you're not vested in any particular outcome or findings. You really are just sort of like... You can't uh, lose, right? Yeah, I mean, you're counsel to the commissioners and you are there in pursuit of the truth. Um, right. mm -hmm. Why can't we do more uh, fact-finding that way? Isn't it the European way, the inquisitorial yeah. way? Why can't we do more of that? Why do we have to be at each other's throats all the time? I think it's a great question. I think Scandinavia, a lot of Scandinavian countries use in inquisitorial processes, maybe other European countries as well. I think that until you do one, it's hard to to articulate how differently things un, sort of unfold. But certainly at the end of each of those processes and, and other sort of shorter corners inquiries and quests I've done, you, you do feel like you have a much more robust, you know, testing and sense of the facts. Um, obviously, the rules of evidence are very relaxed. Um, the commission gathers information and evidence in all sorts of atypical ways. Um, so I think people think of like the public hearing part of commissions of inquiry, um, but we gathered evidence in all sorts of ways. And the other extremely unique thing is, is that you're talking to the commissioners about the evidence you're gathering from day one. Um, you know, there's not this sort of formalistic, everybody in the corners, everybody gathers things, and then the judge walks into the courtroom knowing nothing. Um, you know, they're not judges, but to the extent that they're ultimately the finders of fact and the decision makers, they are like, they, they are <laughs> in the trenches with you from the beginning. You know, I, for one, would love to work with you on any matter, inquiry doesn't even matter, uh, but for those who are much younger than me, and if they're interested in uh, joining your firm, what expectations do you guys have? Who uh, do you uh, are you looking for? What kind of skills or experience are you looking for 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 junior people who want to work at a firm such as yours? So my firm just turned four, so um, my answers to this are somewhat arbitrary. We have, um, I, I think, some grounding in feminist principles uh, and links to community. I think that um, feminism is not about girl power. It's not about, yeah, rah-rah uh, women in charge, which I think is a distinction that's really been eroded. Um, it is really a thinking about systems and structures and uh, the way in which uh, we can move towards a more equal society. And that isn't just about gender. And I think that that's a real falling down of past gen uh, generations of feminists. So I, I think that I look for familiarity and facility with those concepts and people who have really thought about it and not just sort of bought a girl power t-shirt off of Etsy. Um, you know, I would say excellence in legal work, but that doesn't mean that you need to have straight A's. I did not have straight A's. Um, but, um, <laughs> you know, like intellectual curiosity would be a big one for me. Um, the ability or the desire to be an advocate. Um, I think a lot of people are interested in these issues, but you have to be prepared to sit face to face with um, clients who've been through a lot of trauma and need you to be their advocate. And there's a lot of inherent, I think, stress that comes with that for some people. Yeah. Um, so 
you know, we've, we've sort of hired a whole bunch of different people with different backgrounds. I've been lucky to have some amazing junior lawyers at this firm in its short life. And some of them have come here and discovered that it's not actually for them, that, that it was harder to be face-to-face -face with that trauma than they anticipated. Um, and I guess the other sort of atypical piece of advice is that, you know, get a grounding in the um, sort of day-to-day skills of civil litigation, you know, knowing how to take a brief and move it through the process in sort of uh, a smart, efficient way is a, is a very transferable skill. Um, but I think if you look at the associates who are at the firm right now, they all have very different backgrounds. One came from family law, one came from corporate law. One, we just hired back our first summer student uh, who was our summer student, then our articling student. Um, and so there are there are tendrils of those legal uh, areas in our work, but I think that sort of the common denominator, common denominator between them right now is uh, an interest in facility in the firm's core principles and the fact that they're very promising young litigators. Julian Natsu, it was such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for sharing some of your world with me and our audience. Jillian Natsu, everyone. Thanks, Black.